Due to the mature content of today's show, we recommend parental guidance for viewing this edition of Looking to Make a Difference with Gail. The show is intended for parents, educators, it's intended for social workers, people of the court, anyone who has ever felt abused, been abused, or knows of somebody who's been abused. April is Awareness Month for domestic violence and also for child abuse. However, we truly need to be educated each and every day of the year. And today's special guest, K.L. Randis, welcome to Looking to Make a Difference, yes. K.L., is an expert on domestic violence. She's written an extraordinary book, but she also spoke before for the Department of Defense at the Pentagon yes. as an expert. What kind of an experience was that? It was phenomenal. Um, I was invited as their expert speaker to a military training that they had for April because it is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. They wanted to have somebody who I guess could kind of make it more real for the Department of Defense. So they mm -hmm. invited me to come share my story and to kind of speak to the people afterwards and just kind of mingle with everybody. And the feedback that they got was so phenomenal that they actually invited me back again this year to, to do the same event for them, which is great. Kale, I'm so happy that you are here and you've given me permission to call you Kelly. Thank you so much. What makes your book so unique is that you not only describe the occurrences, but in addition to that, you explain things that can go awry when you do share your story. You give the whole educational process, which is really important because we don't want to just know what's happened, but what can we do about it, correct? Right. So the basis of writing Spill Milk and the reason why I penned it was because when I was in high school, after telling on my own father, I found that there was a lack of literature that really explained to a child or to a teen what happens when you actually tell on your abuser. So we do encourage people to tell on their abusers, but then what we're not telling children or teens is what actually happens when you have to go through the judicial system as right. a child, which can be right. really scary. Uh, so I did want to write something that, you know, having experienced that, that would kind of let people know, you know, what to expect and, and kind of the whole process with that. Now, you were asked to speak at the Pentagon for the Department of Defense. What was that like? It was great. Uh, you know, they invited me to uh, speak to the Department of Defense uh, for their annual training that they have in April because it is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. They wanted to invite me there to uh, just give it a more real spin. They did, uh, typically, they would have somebody in, in a military standing do that presentation. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make it a little bit more real last year, so they invited me to come in after actually one of their, uh, somebody at the Department of Defense read my book. So they contacted me, I came out to speak for them, and then I kind of hung around afterwards to just answer any questions. Questions. Excellent. Kelly, Martin Luther King said, our lives end the day that we become silent about things that matter. How does this pertain to you and your book? I think it's important that people know that, I mean, it's exactly true. You know, the, the second that you keep a secret or you stay silent about something that does need to be told to somebody, especially, especially as a child, um, you know, I do think that it can alter you know, the rest of the course of your life. And I think that it is so important that we're giving children and teens the avenues and the ability to stand up for themselves and to come forward about something if something's going on. How difficult was it for you to put this on paper and to share it with other people? It was actually therapeutic for me, mm -hmm. so it wasn't actually something I uh, originally thought that I was going to really share with anybody. I kind of grew up writing in journals and writing poetry, mm -hmm. and it was something I loved to do really from the time I was, you know, I could write. So when I initially wrote it, the idea was it was for me. It was, it was my story. I just kind of wanted to get it down. And my husband read it, and he said, you know, you need to share this with people. This really? is something That's that... That's how it came about. Yeah. He's like, you know, you yeah. really need to let other people know what your story is because I really think it could help people. And, and he was exactly right. Now, you are Brooke Nolan in the book Spilled Milk. Yes. And that's the character, that's the name that you are taking. Mm -hmm. But you told me that the book is 99.99% truth of what happened to you. Right. So why do that with, why is it 0.1% not? 
Right. So I spent a lot of years going through counseling and kind of doing my own self-healing, but there were other family members of mine that weren't quite ready to share what had happened to them or Mm -hmm. to really be put in the spotlight because I was willing to share my side of the story. So I wanted to give them kind of the the comfort and, you know, just the, the privacy that they needed to continue their healing process, but I also wanted to be able to share my story. So in making it a fiction novel that's based on a true story, I was able to tell my story change a few character names, maybe a setting or, you know, maybe something was said here, but it was actually said here right, in real life, right. just to change a few things to make it a little bit more, you know, solid. So should I refer to you in the book as Brooke or should I just say, Kelly, this occurred? You can refer as Brooke. Brooke? Okay. Yeah. So I'll try to remember to do that. Sure. Now you said that journaling helped you. So then you would recommend this for anybody going through a difficult time? I believe that, yeah. I mean, I think that there's, um, a bunch of different outlets that you know everybody's different so mm-hmm. for me it was writing for somebody else it could be horseback riding for somebody else it could be sitting down and having a conversation with a counselor or you know coloring uh, they do a lot of play therapy now yes. with yes. little children which is fantastic because it kind of lets them focus on what they're doing with their hands while they're chatting with a counselor so there's so many different ways to uh, therapeutically you know kind of channel that why are so many children afraid to come forward and tell and say what's happened that's a great question um i don't really know that it's children are free to come forward in my case it was i didn't know to come forward so i think when you grow up in a household where this is the day in and day out norm you don't know anything different and you don't know that something in your house is wrong until you're put in a situation where it's not typical. So in my case, it was, you know, finding out that my house was the one that was not typical and realizing that, you know, I had to tell somebody because this wasn't what was happening in every household across America. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, it's interesting too, that further on in the book, Brooke Nolan, mentions that she asks a girlfriend of hers, Mm -hmm. does your daddy come into your bed at night? And the girl, of course, has no idea what you're talking about. So you were reaching out just to see if that was normal. Is that correct? Yeah. I understood that. Yeah. I think uh, just testing the waters. So when when you do kind of first realize that maybe something isn't exactly right in your household or you you kind of get to that point, you do kind of test the waters with the Mm -hmm. people around you and you kind of say, well, if this was happening, how would would you react? How would you react or, or, or has it ever happened? Exactly. What are some of the tactics predators do use? It's called grooming. Um, so we have a lot of shows, you know, like a Law and Order SVU or, mm-hmm. you know, shows like right. to that extent that do kind of portray, you know, sexual assault happening from a stranger in the dark alleyway when in reality, it's usually people that we know. And the reason behind that is because who better to know a child's routines, who better to know right. what a child will or will not do anything for. So by, you know, kind of getting that information from a child, it, it's really just grooming. So it's, you know, giving a little and taking a little, you know, how far can they push that child based on what yeah. they like? I, I was surprised to find that some 80,000 cases last year in the United States, eight out of 10 children said it was someone they had known. Right. So that, that to me was quite alarming. Yeah. I also want to bring out the point, we spoke a little bit about this prior to the show, that yes, the sexual abuse, horrific. But there are other forms of sexual abuse where a person does not necessarily have to touch a child that can still be considered right. sexually abusive. Right. What are some of those? Um, well, when we're talking about grooming, it could be inappropriate touching. It could be inappropriate mm-hmm. remarks. Um, sometimes there are abusers that would make a child watch pornography with them, right. Um, right. showing them pornography pictures, um, you know, taking pictures of a child, you know, in, in sexually provocative jokes poses or, or, or jokes or, yeah. So there's there's a bunch of different ways. Yeah, and I should list something with you. And it's incredible that you can sometimes have what are called triggers that can make you go back to a, a very early time. And I share with you, it was in fifth grade, my music teacher mm-hmm. used to have me sit on his lap in front of the whole class. Right. And he would touch my cheek, say something, and I'd blush. Mm-hmm. And then he'd joggle me on his lap. Right. That is a form yeah. of grooming, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, any type of, really in, any type of inappropriate touch that's, that has an alternative, or, 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 or excuse me, 
alternative, ulterior, ulterior motive, motive yeah. to it, you know, would be considered any type of grooming from, you know, from an abuser. So anytime they're, they're, they're getting any type of pleasure out of it with touching a child or, you know, having a child around them. It's incredible because if you looked at this man, he looked like a professor. Mm -hmm. He was so much older. I said I was picked out because, and there was another girl and myself because I thought we were so special. And I remember that I wasn't good in music and I was afraid to say anything. And I wasn't even sure it was wrong because he was my teacher. Right. Well, mm -hmm. they're adults, so we're, we're, we're supposed to trust them, right? We're supposed to take yeah. what they say as the truth and sometimes it's not always the case. And that's what makes it and so scary. And I didn't scary. tell anybody until many, many, as an adult, as a grandmother. Sure, yeah. You know, where I even remembered that this occurred. Mm -hmm. So that, that does take place. Mm -hmm. Now... Let's let's talk a little bit in order to better understand what happened. We have to go back to your parents' story. Mm -hmm. When they got married, they were hoping for this white picket fence, mm -hmm. children, right? Sure. A happy marriage. And what happened? I mean, I don't know exactly what happened in their relationship. Um, it's it's kind of interesting because, like, as a small child, you know, you, the, my first memories of my father are not the ideal ones that a, a little girl should be having of her father. So. You know, I can't really attest to what happened with them relationship-wise um, or oh, kind of what he was, you know, yeah. prior well, to. Well, let me ask you this. What was their reality? Did they have this great house? Did they have the white picket fence? Were they thrilled with their life? Right. Well, we lived on a, in a very small house. Um, you know, I had a lot of siblings. Um, you know, we were, I, we considered to be, you know, lower income family, mm -hmm. um, you know, poverty even wise. Uh, we didn't have a lot of food a lot of the times. And, you know, we didn't live in the best of circumstances. But, um, you know, that, that was the reality for us. That was the reality. Mm -hmm. So when teenagers ask you if love is enough, how do you answer them? It's a hard question. So, you know, love is sure. enough. It's, um, and believe me, teenagers will ask difficult and questions. And they do, yeah. I remember doing a speaking event at uh, one of the local high schools to me on teen dating violence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have to get up there and I have to say, you know, that, you know, these bad things happen and, you know, you, ha you can come out above them or, you know, whatever. And I know one thing that I've always told them, too, when I'm speaking is that uh, at the end of it, you know, just because all of these bad things happen to me doesn't mean that you can't find love. You know, Good. I wound up marrying my high school sweetheart right, right, right out of high school. And, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen, too. So, you know, it, it can be. It just depends, I think, on the circumstances and the person. So you always keep it as optimistic because you did find this true love and right. you have a wonderful relationship and children. Right. It's, so it's possible to have a healthy relationship after. Now, yeah. your mother's accident, she was a nurse's aide, had to have changed the whole family dynamic, right. correct? It did. Yeah. Do you think that this contributed to what occurred as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that it helped at all. Um, you know, when she was the way, you know, when she had the surgeries that she had to have for her back, you she know. She had it, many dislocated discs, she yeah. had herniated discs, right. she was constantly in pain. What I'm getting at is that she became addicted to pills. Mm -hmm. Had to have affected her, right? Right. Right. I mean, you know, I, I think it's hard to begin with to have as many kids as you did in my house. And mm -hmm. then, you know, mm -hmm. thrown on top of that, that we were lower income families. So we depended Pressure. just on his income. And then, you know, she was out of work. And I mean, there were a lot of different variables, not to excuse what happened, no, but no. definitely just to kind of paint the picture of the kind of house. But we're trying to we understand in. the dynamics at the time. Mom is in a lot of pain. She's starting to get addicted to pills. Mm -hmm. And she's dependent upon dad's income, isn't she? Right. What I'm saying there is that, and from what I'm hearing about your dad, it sounds like there was control going on. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think there's a bunch of dynamics when you're talking about an abusive household. It's it's not usually just one just thing. Just one thing. So it's like Correct. financial abuse or emotional abuse. Right. So there's, right. there's a lot of different, you know, channels that kind of go into it. Grandparents were adored. Mm -hmm. You absolutely adored them. I did. And we'll be right back. Grandparents, you know, they just adore their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And your grandmother was no different. And on a very special birthday, she took you to Toys R Us. We right. could see the right on you coming out already. Mm -hmm. Because with all the toys, the dolls, and this game, and that game, what did you want? I wound up picking uh, an Aladdin <laughs> and Jasmine uh, journal, or diary, really. It had those little locks with those like keys, the universal keys diary? that every Is diary that like has. Diary? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So that's what I picked. And you know that, that's what I wanted for my birthday when I was, I think, six years old. So. As you said before, that journalism, you know, that, that does help you. Mm -hmm. However, at age nine, your journal is complete. There's no mm -hmm. more money for something like that. Right. So you go to a friend's house and you write. Right. What happens? 
Her mother found the journal, so she confronted my mother about what was written in it, the pictures that I drew in it. Um, it was like a little diary that she had had, and she wasn't really into the journaling thing, so she let me borrow hers so mm. I could go next door. And when we played together, I would write in her journal. So when her mother found it, you know, she kind of called my mom over and said, you know, these are, these are the things that she's writing in here. Like, you know, where do you think she learned these things? And, mm. you know, they chalked it up to late night television or something that I had heard in school or, you know, just really any excuse to kind of explain why it was I was writing what I did. So mom is horrified by right. what she sees in here. She's embarrassed and horrified. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know where you got this from at this point. She says okay. she didn't, yeah. She said she didn't know. Yeah. What message does this give to you, though, that she does hold over your head punishment if you share or ever do this again? Right. So I was. I was punished for it because it was looked at as a bad thing. And, you know, here I was just kind mm. of getting out what I needed to get out. And, you know, it was, you know, if you ever write these things or if I ever see these things again, you know, there, there's going to be trouble. And, you mm. know, it was, I think... Um, you know, not really so much eye-opening because I was so young. It was more or less like, okay, like I need to make sure, you know, that if I am going to write about these things that either my mom can't find them right. or, you know, and that I'm so just not going to write at all. you're nine years old. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Kelly. Why do you think your mother reacted that way? I'm not sure. You know, I really couldn't tell okay. you. You know, as a mother, it's hard for me to, you know, kind of look back and see kind of things that my mom did or didn't do as a mom, you know, as we had said previously that, mm -hmm. you know, your mother is supposed to protect you just like your father is. They're supposed to be the people that love and protect you the best. Right. And in my case, that wasn't the case. Wasn't so the case. it was a little bit harder. And you take on the motherly role. Right. As so often children who are abused do. Right. Let's go back to this whole thing about mothers because there may be somebody in that audience right now who's not quite sure if there's abuse going on in the home. Mm -hmm. How can that person get help? Most counties have a free uh, either rape crisis center or mm -hmm. a domestic violence crisis center that if you just quick Google, if you don't have access to a computer, you can go to your public library. Um, sometimes they're even listed in the phone book, depending on how you can look stuff up. Um, but they do offer free counseling services which they can kind of walk you through whether or not okay. you feel you're being abused. Um, sometimes the flags aren't so red, you know, we, we don't exactly see them. They're right. not waving right in our face. So they can kind of help you with that. They give you these little power wheels that show you the different uh, avenues of abuse that could be potentially could happening be potentially in your home. Abusive. Mm -hmm. And the mother who thinks that something might be wrong, our advice, probably something is wrong. Check it out. Yeah, I mean, I think it like motherly intuition for most people does come into play. But um, I think just by opening, the, allowing the conversation to be open. So a lot of people ask me, you know, how do I get a child to come forward? And, mm -hmm. you know, my answer to that question is that you can't. You can't and I know that sounds child. horrible, but you can't no. force them to talk can't about something. But by being open to that conversation and having that conversation with your children often, it allows them to come to you when and if something does happen. And just keep it open. Right. Don't cast any judgment. Right. Don't don't punish, don't yell, right. but listen right. and keep your ears open and your eyes open. Mm -hmm. And again, as I said before, this is a case where your mom was dependent on your dad, I think, for money. And I think sometimes mothers, maybe in this case, do not want to upset the house. Sure. They have children. And what you fear may be even greater than what's actually happening in their minds. Right. So th that's probably problematic as well. Age 12... You've seen enough, gone through enough. Mm -hmm. You want to take your baby sister, your younger sister, and run away. Right. And you go to your mom and your innocence. And what does she say? Uh, she tells me that if, you know, she saw our suitcases and we said, you know, we're running away to grandma's. And, you know, she told us that if we ever wanted to run away, that she would run away with us. So we unpacked our things and we stayed. Did you feel it was kind of like a trick? At the time, I didn't. You know, mm -hmm. it was genuine at the time, and right. she did get upset, and my sister was, was upset, upset, and I right. was upset. Right. And, you know, you know, why do you want to leave? And, you know, d didn't really get it then. And, uh, you know, looking back now, um, I think it was just a reason to get me to stay get and, you, to you know, stay. to kind of smooth over smooth over the bumps and, you know, make it better. Chicken for the, little. We don't have to see it. Right. You know, cover your hands. You know, right. Like a Band-Aid, you know. Like a Band-Aid. Right. Exactly. Twelve years old. You're having your appendix out. Now, most 12-year-olds would be petrified. Mm -hmm. You look forward to it. I it's did. a break. I did. Tell us about that. 
Well, I was, I was hospitalized, so I had stomach pains, and, uh, you know, my mom had, was telling me that, you know, oh, it's just, you know, a stomach ache or whatever, and I actually went up in the hospital, and I had appendicitis, and I remember being in the hospital and thinking, like, this is great. Like, I've got nurses mm-hmm. tending to me. I'm, you know, I'm eating really good meals, and, you know, I don't have to do anything for anybody, and I'm, I'm not being, you know, approached by him, and it was just a safe place for me, and that was hard to give up, even, you know, just, you know, give, given the circumstances of being in the hospital, it was actually more of like a vacation. I see this little baby here who's how old, three here, four? Four or five, maybe. When did the abuse start? Probably around, around that time, around that age is when I can recall the first couple of times of him coming into my room and, and touching me inappropriately around that age. We have to go through um, this time period. Dinner time is, is horrible at your house. Mm-hmm. Nobody, the, the siblings... You have an older brother, you have a younger brother, you have a younger sister. Nobody wants to sit next to dad right. because he does hit. Right. He can come home really angry. Right. He doesn't hit you, and they tend to think that you're getting away with things. Right. They have no clue what's going on. Right. And in your young mind, you're protecting them, and you don't realize you're probably enabling the situation at the time. Sure. Totally understandable. Mm-hmm. You were like the mother in this particular case. Your dad actually puts a lock on the cabinets. He does. Yeah. What are you eating? Um, um, I mean, school was great because we got free lunches. So. Pop-tarts at night. Exactly. School lunches so you anything, were able to get. Yeah. Anything that we were able to get to really hoard. Um, I was, you know, the, the special child, so I got special treatment. So anytime I could mm. ask for food and he would give it to me, I would either hide it, share it with them, you know, whatever needed to be done. Now, your siblings were being hit. Mm-hmm. And you knew that that would get to physical abuse. Right. You would actually yell in the closets, get the kids in the closets. Right. So your job was to hide them, right. secrete them away from an abusive father. Right. And then they didn't understand how you got to extra hours to stay up late. Right. And you go on to say, but the abuse still with your dad continued like nothing happened. Mm-hmm. Do you wonder at that time what's going on? It was. It was confusing because, um, you know, my siblings did have, I think, a little animosity towards me because of how I was treated. So I was the special child. I got the special privileges. Um, You know, they were the ones getting hit. I was not. So I think it was hard for them to witness. And at the same time, Mm. you know, I think I started questioning, you know, why why am I the special child? Why do I get the special privileges? You know, why Mm. am I not hit? So I think it was confusing, not even just for me, but for them, too. The other thing that, that's, that's fascinating with this is that as an educator, mm-hmm. we tend to think in school of the abusive child, the child who cuts, right. the child who acts out in class, grades suddenly drop, uh, looking for attention, explosive, maybe addicted to drugs. You were not that child. Right. You were the child with the very high grades, mm-hmm. cheerleading. Right. So help us with that a little bit because we're not always as former educators or people in position with children to know and see how this can happen. I think why I'm called so often to do speaking events at high schools and and, and really just everywhere is because they say to me exactly what you just said. They say, well, you were not the textbook example of what happens to Mm -hmm. a child when they're abused. And and I completely agree with them. You know, I, I studied all the time because that was my... That was my retreat. That was my way of That's focusing my attention. Yeah. So I really liked school. I really liked journaling. Um, so I kind of right, put my, right. my focus and my efforts into things that I enjoyed to kind of get away. And uh, I think, you know, when, again, when you're talking about, you know, how do I recognize those signs that are maybe not right. so textbook and clear mm-hmm. cut, mm-hmm. you know, again, it's just by keeping that conversation open. open. So I had many Perfect. people in my life that I spoke to kind of testing the waters first, of course, but, you know, eventually getting to a place where I was comfortable and felt safe enough to have this conversation. And and, and when I did, it was just, it just blew their minds because they had just no idea. We'll be right back. So you meet Paul. Right. And it's attraction at first sight. Mm -hmm. When you meet Paul, you're eventually invited to his home for dinner. Mm -hmm. What a treat. How different is it from your family experience at the dinner table? It was very different. So he was my first boyfriend. It was the first time that I really got to spend any exorbitant amount of time outside of my own home with another family. So I think that's really when kind of the shades started kind of coming up over my eyes and saying like, wow, like, you know, these happy, 
you know, families that talk about each other's day and, you know, they're just so nice to each other. Like, this isn't just on TV. This isn't, you know, fake. It's right here right. in front it's of me. Real. Mm -hmm. It's real. It must have been a shock for you. It was. It was. And if you look at the title, you know, Spilled Milk. Right comes from that. So explain that, please. So that exact, that, yeah, that exact scenario. So I was having dinner at his house and his little brother spilled a glass of milk at the dinner table. And in my house, mm. that would have been reason for my father to get physically abusive to, you know, whichever one of my siblings did that. So in my kind of fight or flight mode, mother intuitive jumped up and I tried to remove his little brother from the kitchen mm. table. And I realized as I'm grabbing him that everybody's just kind of staring at me and they're saying, you know, it's, it's okay. Like it's, it's just a glass of spilled milk. Like we'll clean it up. We'll get him another glass. But my adrenaline at that point was so heightened. And, you know, I just was like, something's not right. Like this, th that was kind of my aha moment with realizing that, you know, my house isn't typical and, you know, there is something going on there. And that's what you said before, you know, how do you know if it's not normal, mm -hmm. if that's all you've ever seen or witnessed or experienced? Right. And now it's a shock for you. And that's difficult for you to talk to Paul about, which you don't. Right. It takes a long time for you to be able to reveal that because you don't want to lose the relationship. Right. It's special. And, you know, young teens do not, most people, do not want to be different than other people. Correct? Sure. Yeah. So I could totally see that. Now, your mom, meanwhile, is having some blackouts. She's in tremendous pain. And she's getting addicted to the pills. Mm hmm there is a time when she wants you to do what to get these pills? Um, well, she had them, and, you know, we, again, were just a poor family, so we didn't have a ton of money, and she told me that she had seen something on the news that said, mm. you know, that her pills could be sold for X amount of dollars, and she wanted to know if I knew of any kids at school that would, that would take them and that we could sell them to to get money for food or to get money for bills or whatever it was. And she wanted you to do that? Right. And it gets to a point where you do it, and what happens? Uh, I wind up getting into a situation where um, a friend of mine that was helping me, he, you know, was with me at the time, thank God, and, you know, I, I had a gun pulled in my face because they tried to steal God. the drugs and right, not give right. me the money for it. And so, she doesn't even hear that. No. It's she's, just, where's the money, where are the pills? Yeah. Totally addicted at this point. Dangerous right. situation I was put in, very, for sure. Very, very dangerous. Yeah. This continues up. Mom becomes pregnant, mm -hmm. and you know I'm not trying to gloss over a lot of the things that happened, right. but I do recall one particular incident where, after the hospitalization, after you were hospitalized, you had to take another shower, and mm -hmm. Mom's upset about that. Do you recall that part in the right. book? Mm -hmm. Would you rather not to go into that? Um, it's something that I'm still not like. Okay sure about and Again, like your comfort comfortable is with more important to me yeah no it's okay but may i say that a rape did occur i did yes okay we have to say that because it was said in court right it had to come out right and that was one <laughs> of the most difficult things for you to address right but when you do go through the system you have to say exactly what takes place which is in hard. order to be believed right. and in your own mind when you're shutting down mm -hmm. and having blackouts that it didn't occur mm -hmm. It has to come out. Right. You do go through, uh, you are impregnated. Mm -hmm. Okay. You do miscarry. It was dad's. Right. And you do at one point feel so depressed that you're suicidal. Right. And you want to know why God hated you. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was a hard, it was a hard point in my life. I just, I didn't really know. I think when I realized everything and I, I just kind of understood like the, the heaviness of it, I didn't think that there was any other option. And I think had it not been for my siblings and me wanting to protect them the way that I did, I don't know that I wouldn't have gone through with it, which is not the answer. Correct. Um, because knowing now right. how many right. resources are out there to help you. Right, Kelly. You know, I just, I had no idea. And, and that's, Kelly, that's kind of what I'm... Tell that person out there in that camera, would you please, that maybe watching this or know of somebody who's sitting there saying, I, I, I don't want to live anymore. What, what do you tell that person? Uh, I think it's important to know that, you know, you matter. And there is, there is somebody, something out there and some resource out there that is going to help you. And, you know, it, it may not be so apparent to you right now, but by taking that first step and at least answering those hard questions, you'll find the resources that you need to, to, to move onward and upward. Look at you today. Mm. Look at the success 
the happiness, the family life. Right. But you didn't think that was possible at that time. Never crossed my mind that I would have the life yeah, I do now. Yeah, and no. I think as teenagers, and many of us still do that, we tend to live just in the moment, which is good, right. but we don't know that there is light at the end of this tunnel. Right. You know, and it's it, a long, dark yeah, tunnel. It can, it can be. It can be yeah. a long, dark, but there will be that light. Right. You never gave up. Where does that strength come from? Uh, I get that question a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a whole, mm -hmm. like, resiliency versus, you know, nature versus nurture question that I get a lot okay, from okay. educators. I, I was going to bring that up later, but you, you brought that up. Yeah. The existentialists say that it is, well, Sartre would say, it's not nature, it's nurture. Mm -hmm. That you can be whatever you want to be in life. Right. We can't put anything on the past. We can only go forward with what we now experience. Right. Do you agree with that? I think you have to make I think you have to make your own choices. Yeah. I think that you yeah. have to consciously choose to either move past something or come out above something. I mean, not to say that I don't have my hard days and that I don't have my right. triggers and right. Right. you know that this wasn't exceptionally hard for me, but I think at the end of the day I had to visualize where I wanted to be mm -hmm. at this point in my life. Correct. And, and here I am. And here you Because are. I took those steps to, to go to counseling, to, you know, use my story as a platform to help other people, to, you know, take those positive steps forward instead of kind of staying still and, and not doing really anything about right. it. Right. And even in our interview, you've been so open, and I love that. I'm trying mm -hmm. to be careful how I word certain things because of the sure. triggers, because I know that this is... This, you still probably have some nightmares from time to time, I would imagine. Your brother, you find out later on, was also abused. Mm -hmm. And it's punishment because he walked in on you. Right. And you were not aware of this. Right. And he didn't do as well. Mm -hmm. I have several brothers that just, um, they never, and I think it's harder for men to cope with it okay. not that they can but that. it's it, it's harder for them to um kind of come to terms i feel like there's almost more of a stigma when you're a man and something has happened Awkward to you this embarrassment to talk about it right so it, it's harder for them to seek counseling it's harder for them to kind of come to terms with it so you know that that whole journey just exemplifies you know even even more so than mine so i think that there is more of a struggle just because of the stigma, because of the, you know, I'm a man, I'm supposed to protect myself. Protect I can, myself. you know, right, take right. care of myself. And, you know, when, when they are abused, mm. it's, you know, it's that much more. Also, there was a professional had spoken about this nature versus nurture. Right. And he said the interesting thing is the argument whether resiliency is nature or nurture. Are we born with it or is it taught to us? And you hung on every part, every, every word that he said. But I like what he said, and I'm going to use this quote mm -hmm, from your sure. book. These children usually have strong mentors from a young age that they can build their strength on. They have some kind of talent. They have some kind of outlet, and they're intelligent. Mm -hmm. Your grandparents, right. your teachers, mm -hmm. how significant are teachers in your life? And then you meet Paul's mother, right. who takes on this beautiful supporting role, Gina. Yeah. How much did she help you? Um, I mean, she was a... She was a star key player in, in all this, you know, it, it just, it's, it's funny how you kind of look back as an adult and you say, you know, I didn't realize how I had, you know, this support system around me that it was there the entire time. I just, I didn't even know it was there. And, you know, she was, That's she was so a key true. player. Mm -hmm. And at times you even wanted somebody to ask you, mm -hmm. you gave out hints, you were throwing things out there, right. but you want, you are still very young. Right. When we come back, I want to talk about the power wheel. You met the wonderful Midge. What a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. And she talks to you about the power wheel. Can you explain that? Yeah, so Midge was my counselor at that free crisis center that I mentioned that every county has. So I found mine, and I did counseling services with her for a while. And she brought out this power wheel, literally our very first appointment, and she kind of just broke it out. It's like a little pizza pie, and it said, you know, financially this is how financial abuse looks like and this is what emotional abuse looks like and sexual oh. abuse and physical abuse and it just kind of gave examples around the whole pie chart of what that looked like and it resonated with me so deeply that I wound mm. up sleeping with that power wheel under my oh. pillow for oh. for weeks because I just thought you know this is literally my life on a chart and it was just it was very eye-opening for, for a very first appointment with a counselor. So you could identify with it right and it became a security blanket it too did. because it was, like, it was you. What I'm feeling is real what's happening is real it was almost like a, a validation of what was going I was on in my house. I say somebody gets it. Right. Exactly. And, and that's the other thing with somebody who's been abused. Mm -hmm. 
does somebody get it? Do right. they believe you? Do exactly. they do they understand you? And Midge had gone through a rough time herself. She did. So she totally got it. Right. Now I know as an educator, I've had uh, former students come up and want to talk to me, and very careful because I believe when someone tells you something in confidence, mm -hmm. it should stay that way. Sure. Unlike that today, if someone tells me, but the one thing I will say is if you're hurting yourself, hurting someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, I do have to share if it is any kind of abuse sure. because that was my job. So you share this with her, but you kind of hint because she tells you that as well up front. Mm -hmm. So I think that's significant. Yeah. Right? Yep. She tells me that's kind of a, as a mandated reporter. Most she has counselors to. are. So you, employees are. So you uh, imply and she can infer certain things. Exactly. But she totally understood it. Mm -hmm. I was disappointed with social services, right. as many people would be having read your book. Mm -hmm. You try to tell them what's going on, and they turn around and tell your parents what was said. Right. When you say something in confidence, and this I've learned not only from the book, but from working with children, mm -hmm. that's got to stay in confidence. Exactly. And if you can't, you better tell them that, yeah. because that trust level. So what happens there with that social services? Um, well, I mean, it did put me in a really dangerous position. Mm -hmm. So they had come to my school based on several anonymous phone calls that they had received mm. from, you know, the child helpline and me being one of the people who had called. So, mm. you know, they did show up to my school and they did a little interview inside of, you know, the principal's office at our school. And they said, you know, you can trust us. You know, whatever you say to us, we'll be in confidence. confidence. And, you know, I, I, I gave them a little, but not a ton, but just enough, just enough to get them to know that there was something going on. And. I'm, I'm kind of glad that I trusted my gut at that time because they did send a letter home saying, you know, wow. your daughter, Kelly Randall, said, said oh X, Y, gosh. and Z. And I had been the only one of my siblings who at the time had said something. Everybody mm. else was so horrified or, you know, so scared that or they were frightened. like, you know, we're not going to say anything. Right, right. So it, it kind of put the spotlight on oh me and, you know, it turned into a conversation that my father and my mom both wanted to have with me. You know, did you say these things because these people are going to come to our house You're now. You're put on the spot like You're that. You're going to be put in foster care. We're oh, going to lose our gosh. house. We'll lose our job. So it was like those subliminal threats then based on sure. them knowing that I was the one who said something. So, of course, you have to say, I don't know what you're talking about, right? right, right. You have to keep the family together, all of that pressure and still getting good grades. Mm -hmm. But I, I think I see what happened there. Go in your room. It's the one place that you're left alone. Right. And what you're doing, you have to be very bright and focused to do this, is you're concentrating on that schoolwork. Yeah. You're concentrating on learning. Learning must have been fascinating for you. It was. I mean, I always loved it. I always loved going to school. I loved learning. I loved reading. I loved writing. That was your so outlet. That was my outlet. That was your, your way out. Right, which is why people didn't identify with my red flags. Because Correct. Because as, as obsessive yeah. as some people can be about maybe turning to drug addiction or, mm -hmm. you know, those negative kind of red flags, I was turning more towards the positive so ones. Hard. Unintentionally, that's just what I did. But, you know, it, you know, that was my outlet. Let's go back to school now. There comes a point where you go to your aunt and uncle. Mm -hmm. and, and they kind of figure things out. They're, they're hearing. They heard about this, social right. services. Right. And they offer you this safe haven. Tell us about the bubble. So uh, I wind up going to their house. They said, you know, Kelly, we, we got a call from your mom. And she said that social services was there. And we just, we want to have a, a chat. So can you come to our house? And I did. And they sat down with me. And, you know, I don't know as adults if they saw things that I didn't necessarily have to say. say. So they saw things right. and they said, you know, something just isn't so, quite right here. So... They had a discussion amongst themselves, and they said, you know, listen, um, we've got this bubble around our family, and you're in that bubble. Oh. And, you know, if there's something you need to tell us, now would be the time to do it, because we will promise you that you and your siblings will not be put in foster care. You will mm. not be broken up. We will keep you together. This is a safe place. You can tell us. And I think it was just a matter of right timing, right place, right sure. people, all of those things kind of came together at once and I was like, you know what, like this is exactly the moment I've been waiting for. Like this is the exact circumstances I've been waiting for. So we have to wait till the child is ready. Mm -hmm. And you also said one other thing happened, if I remember correctly, rage. Mm -hmm. You were angry. I was. Your mother now has given birth to a beautiful baby whom you named. Right. And ironically, your mother survives all these other surgeries and then in childbirth she almost died. Right. And you're thinking, no, this, you know, you're, you're petrified because right. now you've got to be in charge of everything. But the baby actually becomes such a blessing to you. He does. He, he truly does. Right. 
he was my reason to stick around. So, you know, I kind of had my own plan of, you know, I'm going to graduate high school and I'm out of here and I don't have to deal with any of this and I can go as far away as I want as I can. And then he happened and, you know, he was just kind of like now my reason to stay and right, fight, right. really. See, mm -hmm. that that's amazing. You go back to school, mm -hmm. all right, now dad is out of the house. They're going right. to take a two years for this trial right. and, and to bring everything and bring him to bring it to justice, but you go back to school, and Paul, who's a teenager, his mm -hmm. reaction? Not so great. Not so good. Yeah. But, but let's share a little bit of that, if sure. we could, because I think that's important to know, too. Right. No, it is. Um, so Paul was my first boyfriend, and I think just the, the weight of what I had gone through, what my family had gone through, um, him just being a typical which was yeah, great, a, a typical teenager. high school boy. Yeah. He didn't quite get it, get it and, no. you know, was not supportive and, you know, could have been more than what he was. And, you know, I think it was kind of one of those situations where um, I was depending too much on him, not not on him, but, like, on his support, right. you know, as, as somebody who just, like, needed somebody in that respect. And, you know, he kind of let me yeah. down in that sense. And, and also he came from a family where the... This would be unheard of. Right. It was out of his realm. I don't think he probably was conversant with something like this. Yeah, I think it's, you know, yeah. again, when it's yeah. not something that you're too familiar with right. or have experience right. with, um, not to any fault of his own. It's just, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot to put on a high school boy. So, that... you, so you go back to school. There's gossip. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, people in school who work there, the, the children hear about it. Right. And, and Paul... You know, it was so upsetting to me. He says, you're disgusting. Yeah. And you're heartbroken by that. Uh, you do get emancipated, mm -hmm. right? And that's important. Why? Um, well, emancipation is when basically the court decides that a child is able to take care of themselves. So okay. the process for that was actually very lengthy. So at the time, I couldn't stay in the house that, you know, once I told, couldn't stay in the house that, you know, I knew what had gone on in there. So I basically lied to my mom at the time and said, you know, okay. I've been emancipated. Right. If you want to check, you can. Because um, she but, wanted you to come back in the house. Right. She wanted you to work. She wants everything to go back the way it is. Exactly. Except that your dad is out. Let me ask you about these triggers. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that. We, we know the word trigger, of course. Right. That something happens, and because of that, when it happens, it makes you recollect these horrible things. Right. But you go back into the house, the same bedroom, right. the same house, and you can't do it. Why? And help us out understanding something like that. I think once once I came forward with everything and I and I knew that it wasn't a secret anymore and I didn't have to hide things and I was kinda of, it was kind of like that freeing moment. Sure. I didn't want to go back to that place where I had to pretend that my feelings weren't there or that, you know, the emotions I was feeling were not there. So right. for me, it was just a bit much to be in the same house, in the same bedroom where I had so many terrible memories of, of him, of, you know, just everything that had gone on there. So, you know, the last place I wanted to be that I felt safe really was in that house. And mom thinks by taking the father role out, mm -hmm. everything can go back as well, gets the room all redone, everything's going to be okay again. Right. But it's not. She couldn't understand that. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you were emancipated through the court. Uh, and going into court, interestingly enough, siblings will not testify. Right. Why is that? Um, I did have a conversation with the DA, the district attorney, and um, it, it's more or less like what you can prove and not prove in a court of law, which is, which is hard. So right. my siblings yeah. were not uh, in a place where they were okay with being in front of him and testifying and, okay. and saying kind of what had happened. It's, it's, it's extremely hard. Um, and where I had been going to counseling previous to even saying anything to anybody, yeah, I had time. kind of had the supports there. I, right. you know, kind of had that yeah. support team and an idea of what was going to happen. They were just scared. They, they were, were just, yeah, you know, right. it's one thing to, you know, maybe tell a counselor this, but to sit in a room and, and literally point the person out and say, sure. this person is doing these things to me. It's still your father. Or you you right. grew up with him no matter how bad. That, that is your father. Mm -hmm. And that's the role that you have of him. Right. So it was hard for them yeah, to, you know, I kind of move that. past that. So, I mean, quite literally, uh, my oldest brother, like, handed that torch to me. He's just like, you need to kind of handle this, like, for us, like, for everybody. A shock for you. Yeah. Right? That's very yeah. upsetting because you think you're helping them all this time. Right. Now's your chance. But you also make a very good point. Some people simply do not want to be saved. Can mm -hmm. you explain that? Yeah. I think, you know, at the end of the day, the choices that you make 
to to get the help that you need. Um, so, you know, not to say that it's not hard. I think the statistics are something like a woman leaves a man seven times when she's in an abusive relationship before she leaves for good. good. So, right. you know, I tested the waters several times before I finally said, okay, this is definitely happening. Like, here's what's going on. Like, I need some help here. So, you know, it is a process. And I think until you get to the point that you yourself know that you want something to happen, you want a different life, you want there to be changes, Nobody can force you to that decision right. and nobody can force you to get to that place where you want something to change. You kind of have to get there yourself. And then you get to the jury and the first time, what was it, the hung jury? Hung or? jury. Hung jury. Mm -hmm. And shocking. And, and of course, you're appalled by this, as you well should be. Right. But you have the one juror who held out. What does he say to you? So it, it was something that the courthouse had never seen before. So all of the jurors congregated outside the courthouse mm. when the trial was over. It was a hung jury, which meant that they couldn't come to a decision, so we would have to do a retrial. And, you know, the, the secretary comes running in, and she says, you know, the jury is outside the courthouse, and they want to speak to Kelly. Mm. And, you know, so we go outside, and, you know, everybody was crying. The jurors were crying, and, you know, especially the women, and they were hugging me. And the one juror came up to me, and he said, listen, like, I believed you. I just, I had some questions. And, you know, as a jury, it's not like they can exactly be like, you know, raise their hand and ask a question. Right. So they right. said, what we'd like to do is meet with the district attorney and tell him this is what was confusing to us. This is what we needed clarification on. So the next time you go do this, okay. you know, you'll, you'll have everything that you need. That's fabulous. Mm -hmm. And you don't see yourself as a victim. You said that you are a survivor. Right. I would go a step further and say you are a thriver. Thanks. Because you take that, thank you, mm -hmm. you take all that and, and you help other people and you're still growing as a person from this, aren't you? Every day. Don't I you mean, find that? I mean, every day is a different, a different trigger, maybe a different struggle. Um, you know, I maybe talk to somebody uh, on my Facebook page who reaches out to me and, you know, just the things that they and say, it's like, do. you know, you think, you know, and, and what happened to me was, it was awful, it was terrible, but there's always somebody else out there that, you know, their story is just as bad or, you know, maybe even worse or, you know, maybe somebody didn't believe them mm -hmm. or they didn't have, you know, that really support supportive system. person. Exactly. So, And you became a community advocate. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple more questions here. You would like to get closure and you get the chance to see Paul. Mm -hmm. You're already involved with somebody else, mm -hmm. but you get to see him. How important was that for you while later to see him? It was. Um, you know, I think really just any any high school relationship. It would have been any boy. Regardless. From high school that right. I think anytime there is a breakup, sure. there's, you know, that clo that need for closure. And I think especially in my case, because of the weight of what had happened, I really needed to know if what I felt during that relationship yeah, and afterwards was, was real, was real and if there was oh, substance sure. to it. And and not to say, you know, that we didn't have a great relationship at times, um, but you know, it wasn't it high wasn't school. where I am now. And it right. was a high it school high relationship, school. exactly. It was a growing experience. Exactly. Do you find people who are in abuse situations today, uh, perhaps other women maybe write to you, are afraid that they're going to be abusive as well? It, it depends. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I do get that. Some people have asked me, you know, are you afraid that you might abuse your kids mm -hmm. because the statistics are so high right, right, for a child right, maybe right. abusing their own children. And I think the reason for that is not necessarily because they want to abuse their children, but it's because that intervention hasn't happened yet. So, again, it's they don't know any different way of parenting. They don't know any different way of living or, you know, lifestyle-wise. So it's not that they don't want to change. It's just that they've never had that Have intervention you know, or opportunity, opportunity exactly to. to change their lives and to change the direction it's going well, we in. We have a great clip of you with mm -hmm. your baby. I think your husband's in yeah. it. I'd love to take a look at this and then comment on it, okay? Great.
He's Jason in the book. He's wonderful, tremendous empathy, and it's so nice to see you so happy. Mm -hmm. Your relationship today with sisters, family. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, it's 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 kind of what I say. What I say about the relationship I have is uh, it is what it is with okay. some people. Um, but you know, I, okay. I I'm still very close to some of my brothers. Um, you know, some that I I didn't think we would have that relationship because of you know, how hard it was for them when I was testifying and kind of everything that had happened. Sure, um, sure. Wasn't really sure where our relationship would come out on the end. So, um, you know, I'm really close to some of them. I'm not so close to some other okay, people, but it's, you know, it is what it is kind of thing. And I do have a tremendous amount of support from my family about the book, which That's is great. That's beautiful. Yeah. I know that you also offer advice and you say that you should know the court system before you go into it mm -hmm. if you're in that situation. Right. And it would help if you spoke with somebody of the same sex. And you don't even have to speak. Write it down. Yeah. Because it's so much easier. Where can people reach you today? I, I love your T-shirt. Where can they reach you today to talk to you, to get advice, to sure. find out, um, you know, well yeah, I have a website. Uh, it's kalerandis.com. And then I also am on Facebook. A lot of, I think my fans reach out to me most on there because it's social media. So they'll message me on sure. there. Um, and it's uh, just facebook.com slash spilledmilkrandis. I want to thank you so much for everything that you've done today. And I know that you've helped quite a few people. Thank you so much thank for you. having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Perfect.